Well, good afternoon, everyone. We're continuing with our NPTEL Ideologies course 2019-20. We're coming towards the end of our eighth topic, that is post-structuralism and postmodernism. I'll start with uh, uh, a brief recap on the major problems in the two main post-structuralist thinkers we've looked at, that is Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault. And uh, we'll then go on to uh, a sort of worked example on postmodernism and the nature of postmodernist theory with examples of postmodern phenomena, or what might well count as postmodern phenomena. And we'll wind up by looking at the, uh, as part of that, we'll wind up by looking at the consequences of the SoCal hoax, which I, uh, so SoCal hoax, which I um, described at the end of the, um, the last lecture. Well, we need to recap briefly on the main problems in the major post-structuralist thinkers, that is Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault. We'll start with Derrida. Now, the main problems I argued last time in his work were, first of all, that if anything is potentially pertinent to any text, and it doesn't mean written text, it could mean a work of art, it could be a historical account of something, it could be even our sense of, our, of a particular historical period, or something that somebody's done, or political events, or whatever. If anything is potentially pertinent to a reading of that, and we can, remember Derrida says we can only understand a text if we include what got left out in our understanding of the text. One consequence is that we seem to lose, the text seems to lose all boundaries, and Derrida himself says, il n'y a pas de art text, in effect there is nothing outside the text or no outside to the text. But this immediately causes a major problem. Derrida seems not to realize that we need some sense of a criterion for pertinence. There is, of course, going to be no one criterion for pertinence, but Derrida even uh, seems not to recognize that this is an issue. We have to show how some extraneous or external factor makes a difference to our reading of a text. It might have been the weather, it might have been a period in the author's life, it might have been political events around, it might have been anything. And yet Derrida seems not to see that we need to show that such factors make a difference, even the bits that fell on the floor or were discarded or crossed out. We need to show that they make a difference to our reading of the text. Derrida seems not to realize that this is an issue. Seems not to. Secondly, well, is any work um, self-contained in the way that Derrida seems to think it has been claimed it is self-contained? Well, Who's ever made that claim? Yes, the, the new critics, I.A. Richards, possibly Leavis, uh, Between the Wars um, uh, at Oxford, wanted their students to, to focus on the text irrespective of anything else. But that immediately created a, a problem for students who perhaps hadn't the same educational background, um, perhaps came from a less, less elite class, and might have struggled with some of the cultural nuances and references and allusions in the text, as indeed we would if we were reading a novel even translated into our own language from another historical period or another vastly different culture. Now, that does happen. But Derrida seems never to show that anyone has actually made the claim that a text is a completely self-enclosed and self-substitutive entity. So that's the second major problem in Derrida. What about Foucault? Well, the three or four major problems that I went through last time, and I'll uh, recapitulate them briefly here. First of all, Foucault seems to think that we are untroubled about the ways we encounter the world, and that this assumption needs to be, so to speak, rendered problematic or in investigated or interrogated. But surely that claim simply cannot be taken seriously. Is it really the claim that we are untroubled, that we have taken the world as a given, 
socially, psychologically, personally, politically, economically, scientifically, surely mighty scientific discoveries have taken place precisely because people, so to speak, looked beneath the surface or saw disjunctions, radical disjunctions even, in their own experience or what people said and did and so on. Within psychology and psychiatry, Adi Lang created a, a sensation by taking the patient's lived experience seriously and not treating them as an object of scientific curiosity. He raised questions about what it was about their experience that actually did make sense. Now, that's just one example. And of course, with the sciences, well, think of the possibly apocryphal story of Newton's discovery of, of gravitation. Did he really have to reach the conclusion he did that there's something wrong with the way we explain falling? A cartoon of Newton once showed, showed him sitting under an apple tree, an apple falls on his head, and the next cartoon shows him wearing a rather strong hat to protect his head. But the point is that he asked a question. Now, the claim that we have always been untroubled and that that fact itself needs interrogating is surely not to be taken seriously, that we've untro been untroubled about our experience and our knowledge of the world. Secondly, that claim implies a further claim which Foucault does make. He seems to think, he thinks that our previous methods of inquiry and investigation are in some way inadequate. Well, what's new about that? That kind of claim runs through philosophy, through the humanities, through the sciences, and so on. We've always queried our methods of inquiry and queried the kinds of worlds that different methods of inquiry depict to us. We've always questioned theories of human nature, and so on. Again, Foucault seems not to realize that that he needs to show in what ways his own proposed method of inquiry is so superior to the others. And that's an old philosophic task. People are always doing that. Or at least were until they started, perhaps following Hegel and Wittgenstein, that uh, started thinking that formulaic methods in philosophy are themselves highly problematic. But Foucault never, never shows how it is or why it is that our previous the previous methods of inquiry that he wants to reject are themselves inadequate. Thirdly, Foucault certainly says and tries to show that what we consider to be a search for knowledge is no more than a search for power. This then mean, means that discoveries, the communication of discoveries, the application of knowledge and so on whether scientific knowledge or not, are no more than expressions of a lust for power or an attempt to impose our power on other people. But that is profoundly self-contradictory. It means that we cannot tell what is and is not the operation of power. Even my explaining or attempting to explain Foucault to yourselves becomes not an attempt at an explanation of the work of Foucault, which you can then check by reading Foucault, by, you can check it by reading what other people said about Foucault, what I've said about Foucault, and you can query this rationally by saying, well, you said X, Y, and Z, or X says P, Q, and R about it, uh, about Foucault. Now, is that right? I've read a passage where, and so on and so forth. But no, if we take Foucault really at his word, then even my attempt to explain something, or even telling you the truth that say the building's on fire and we need to leave in a great hurry, is not the communication of knowledge to you, it is just the expression of power. This, as Peter Dews says, he says it most wonderfully well, makes power a completely metaphysical principle because power pervades everything we say and do. We cannot tell what is an expression of the search for power and what is not it becomes a completely metaphysical principle. It also loses its explanatory, literally loses its explanatory power because everything becomes some kind of power operation or not. Or some kind of power operation and, I should correct myself, some kind of power operation and nothing else. Even telling the truth, showing the evidence, all that disappears. In effect, Foucault is trying to give us a rational argument to tell us that Rational investigation is no more than a search for power. 
And he is, as I've said in print before now, rationally requiring of us that we abdicate rationality. He's re requiring us reasoningly to abdicate reasoning. That is a contradiction in any, no matter which way we look at it. Foucault's work, as I've said in print before, said elsewhere, is enormously troublesome and problematic. And there we are. Being required reasoningly to abdicate reasoning is not something we can actually do unless we throw, abandon all reasoning. Are we prepared really to do that? I gave some examples last time of, say, being on the, uh, you know, on the uh, stretcher in the operating theatre when a surgeon comes in and says, yes, I think you need so much anaesthetic today. No, no, we'll give you a bit more. Instead of calculating our weight, looking at the condition of our health, our previous medical records and so on. We also looked, I also mentioned the example of, say, ground crew refueling an aircraft. Oh, we think that's enough. That'll get you 5,000 kilometers with it. Have you calculated the aircraft's consumption, right? And how much fuel it'll need for this distance and so on? Oh, no, we just felt like it, right? Now, that is an implication. A further implication, as I said, was that our banks might cease to calculate our accounts. They might just estimate the figures. It is those consequences that seem to have occurred only very belatedly, if they did at all, to the more enthusiastic proponents of post-structuralism and later postmodernism in literary and literary theory and other theories in the humanities. But we need to look at postmodernism and its manifestations in the world. They're not unintelligible. We do see examples of them, and there's some very good work detailing examples of activities which they quite reasonably characterize as postmodernist and they demonstrate the kinds of problems in them. We we'll look at uh, three items today and as usual I can't put the items on screen but I can put the titles on screen and you'll get them in a PowerPoint. These are the three items. The first is a paper by Eric McGuckin written in 2005. The title is Travelling Paradigms, Marxism, Post-Structuralism, and the Uses of Theory, published in a journal called Anthropologica, I think it's the Canadian Journal of Anthropology, in 2005. Another one is by Aaron Hanlon, who is a professor of philosophy, if I'm not mistaken, and the title is Postmodernism Didn't Cause Trump, It Explains Him. That's in the Washington Post, th 30th of August 2018. It's... Uh, the kind of thing that the high quality press in most parts, most democratic countries do carry from time to time. The Washington Post incidentally is the paper responsible for the um, exposure of the Watergate scandal and the uh, really thorough determined lengthy investigation into it later by Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. But this piece in the Washington Post written by an academic philosopher is very direct and extremely well informed. The third is on the Impact and Implications of the SoCal Hoax. It's a paper by Michael Berube, dated 2009. It's called Post Hoax Ergo Propter Hoax. The title is taken from a Latin saying, Post Hoc Ergo Propter Hoc, which trans literally translated says, after that, therefore, on account of that, or therefore because of that. Published in the American Scientist, 2009. So we look at these three, Eric McGarkin, Aaron Hanlon, and Michael Berube. These are all freely accessible. Well, let's take a look at this one first, at the Eric McGuckin paper. Right, I'll uh, get this up. Here we are. Okay, published by the Canadian Anthropology Society, to give it its correct title, uh, in 2005. And I'll summarize the key points. Uh, the author is, if I'm not mistaken, an anthropologist. And he says he was in Taramshala, as he says, drinking a beer, reading a copy of Newsweek, when he spotted an advertisement by the Boeing Aircraft Corporation. And it said, travel, as the injunction or command. Flight turns the world into a single marketplace. Well, 
I'll just pause that. Can I expand this? Is it possible to? Okay, I'll pause there. Flight turns the world into a single marketplace. Well, the author was sitting in Dharamshala, the seat of the Tibetan government in exile. And he was looking at, he was doing research on the impacts of ethnic and spiritual tourism in Tibetan crafts. So this, this advertisement struck him immediately. And there was a two-page spread in reds and browns, displaying exotic goods and so on, all artfully arranged around a tattered Union Jack, or Union flag more accurately, the flag of the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, as he says, uh, a nostalgic icon of a long, of a, of a benign colonialism, an imagined benign colonialism, that resonates, does have an impact on many travelers from imperial or former imperial nations. Uh, he, was also, he also mentions, McGuckin also mentions ethnic tourism, which he calls a strange new form of economic imperialism. Finished goods and memories are carried from the periphery, the former imperial territories, to the center, that is, the former imperial imperialist countries where many people are, as he says, hungry for handmade, in quotation marks, authentic, in quotation marks, authentic goods or imagery. And these goods seem to escape commodity status in the minds of many consumers. They're authentic, they're real, they're handmade, they're not commodities. So, what happens? Inevitably, Many communities around the world attempt to cash in on this explosion, as he calls it, of world travel. McGuckin calls it an explosion. We're familiar with that, the enormous expansion of world travel. And this transforms domestic crafts into effectively factory, factory production, into factory manufactured souvenirs. Sacred objects, ritual performances, even people's bodies become marketable commodities. Household and sweatshop craft production is growing. This was 15, nearly 15 years ago now. Rates of exploitation increase. So, well, McGuckin recognizes that there has been scholarly work on this. Some recent anthropological literature, as he says, deploys the terminology of travel and the internet as general metaphors for postmodern disjuncture and displacement. He could have said dislocation. The idea of location seems to, seems to lose, its, uh, lose its force, lose its meaning. Supposedly modernist, he quotes, puts the term in inverted commas, modernist, modernist critiques of the destruction of authenticity have therefore been displaced by more pluralistic, as he says, dialogic approaches influenced by by recent theorists, Bakhtin and Baudrillard. He mentions the Canadian philosopher, I think she's Canadian, Van Can Adams, who posits virtual identities, and these are constructed in dialogue with the purchasing observer, with the, with the touristic buyer. Yes, this discourse is local in aim, but like all discourses, it's always partial. It foregrounds consumption in this case, and brings particular intersections of discourses and desiring bodies, wanting bodies, that is the, uh, the tourists or visitors, into high resolution, into close focus. Well, McGuckin is cautious here. He says he's not putting forward a materialist account as if materialism is superior as a, as a vocabulary or a method of explanation. And he's not claiming that class is the, as he says, the master key to all social relations. What he is saying is that the kind of approach he's taking provides, a, as he says, a more useful lens for an engaged anthropology. Why is that? Because he says it facilitates global comparisons and policy recommendations amidst what he calls a proliferation, a plethora of discourses around surrounding postmodern tourism. 
So what are the uh, implications then? Yes, McGuckin says the Boeing advertisement made him laugh out loud. But it also struck him, it tempted him. He attempted to use a relatively narrow focus, as he says, on the production of Tibetan exile crafts and commoditized ritual objects as an entry into a broader description of the tourism economy, a kind of way in, a doorway in. And not just the tourism economy, but shifts in ethnic class and gender politics. Here he says he followed a padre, presumably Arjuna Padre, and Kopitov, 1996, and he aimed to construct, so to speak, biographies of artifacts, of particular things, so that he could link these to more global economic pressures as found in other work as well, June Nash in particular. But, as McGuckin himself says, the the impacts, the causal forces, the impacts of tourism on craft production are very diverse and they're far-reaching and they weave together a complex, as he says, dialectic, a hand-in-hand -hand relationship between practice and ideas, a complex dialectic of cultural consumption and material production. Perhaps, as he says, the, the Boeing advertisement was, was an easy target, but he goes on, he doesn't stop there. McGuckin develops his theme and he says, well, is this an example? You know, he offers it as an example of Marx and Engels' prediction that capitalism would, he quotes, nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. We've already seen in our account of Marx that once we accept commodity production in one system, we have to, in anywhere in a system, we have to, well, it has to permeate the entire system, otherwise it cannot survive. For example, if we work eight hours a day, we have to make, we have to have supplies available on our days off or when we're on our way home outside of work. We can't simply disappear from work because we need to get potatoes and onions and garlic and whatever on the way, you know, to take home later. The system collapses if we, if everyone doesn't participate in it. So here we are, Marx and Engels predicted that Capital would, I repeat, nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, and establish connections everywhere. What would it create? As they themselves say, Marx and Engels themselves say, a world after its own image. Well, they, we got in quotes again from them. They saw, Marx and Engels saw, that in place of old wants satisfied by the productions of the country, we find new wants requiring for their satisfaction the pro products of distant lands and climes. The uh, exploitation of the world market, again a quotation from Marx and Engels, would lead to a, again he quotes, a cosmopolitan character to production and consumption in every country. These passages remind us of the transnational character of their own consumerism. McGuckin here seems to be referring to his own students. But we are, perhaps should be reminded of this, the transnational character of our own consumption and consumerism all the time. Think of the uh, sources, the truly international global sources of things we use every day, such as mobile telephones. Well, McGuckin says that when students discover that working conditions in the, in the sweatshops producing their genes rival the brutality of Marx's time when they see that wages in Northern California are tied to those in Mexico and that rising tuition fees and shrinking course offerings are tied to the political and corporate discourse as well as regressive tax structures. When they start, when they make these connections, McGuckin says, they begin to discover mutual interests with working peoples across differences of culture, ethnicity, and gender, perhaps also location. You'll no doubt be well aware that scandals over sweatshops in developing countries, or as it used to be called, or as they used to be called the third world, are deeply feared by, by the global brands which outsource production to the sweatshops. Well, what about McGuckin? His own work, 
led him to query the very category of tourism. He says that too must be interrogated. He tried to differentiate between types of foreign consumers. He drew upon Cohen here, who's given us a classification of mainly psychological types of traveller, recreational, diversionary, experiential, experimental and existential. Well, I'm sure we've met people around the world who fit any or all of these categories, or more than one of them, or perhaps none at all. And McGuckin says he finds these categories useful for thinking about motivations for travel and thinking about demands for authenticity in crafts. Is this real? Is this what they really do out there? But, he says, he's also found that motivation itself didn't predict consumption patterns in any simple way. Demands for authenticity themselves vary between and within categories of consumers and between different types of goods and cultural production. Well, we shouldn't be surprised that the category of different types of traveller is perhaps a simplification. We shouldn't be surprised that motivations for travel and demands for authenticity do arise, or thinking about motivation becomes a question, but motivation itself doesn't predict consumption patterns, and demands for authenticity do also vary across consumers and across goods and cultural productions. So where does this, where does this take us? McGuckin continues his investigation, his reflections. What he says is that, well, handicrafts, he finds that handicrafts may be appealing in part because of their apparent status as products of non-alienated, that is, non-commodity produced labour. These allow, according to McGuckin, consumers to imbue these artefacts with personal meanings so to speak, to singularize them. And these can be imbued with, imbued with personal meanings more readily than, say, mass-produced goods. Oh, I happened to see that. It was one of 10 million on the production line in such and such a place, and I got it. Well, we might say that about headache pills that we might buy from a local chemist in just about any part, part of the world, any chemist or pharmacist. But that does not apply to the kinds of goods McGuckin is talking about. He's talking about art and craft objects which seem to be produced in non-alienated and non-alienating systems. And, well, we can singularize these more readily than we can mass-produced goods. But, according to McGuckin, the ways we do this is through often imaginary and idealized histories of the ways the goods were produced and exchanged, produced and sold. One suggestion by Miller, whom McGuckin draws upon here, is that in these types, with these types of object, production itself becomes a fixed, a reified concept with a separate connotation, a different meaning. And what's important is not the actual process of manufacture, but the object's ability, the fact that the object can stand, for a particular type of production and its attendant social relations. Symbolize a particular type of production and the relations that, that attend upon that, that, that go to making up that system of production. Miller says here, he utters a cautionary word, an object therefore may proclaim one technological origin while it actually derives from another. With tourist arts, Objects rapidly produced by peace workers, paid at peace rate with little control over cultural motifs, may masquerade as the products, products of artistic care, and invented traditions may signify timeless essences. Well, yes, in the, in the global handicraft trade, as McGuckin says, Certain types of motifs, of logos or images, function as signifiers. He puts in question marks the word trademarks, trademarks, question mark. In this example of Tibetan identity, 
even as these cultural motifs are grafted onto foreign objects and thrown into, as he says, surreal co combinations with other goods. Ritual daggers become letter openers for new ages. Tibetan Buddhist icons are stitched by Indian laborers onto woven backpacks, otherwise indistinguishable from those for sale in the craft markets of Cusco or the East Village. The East Village, of course, Manhattan Island in New York. The transnational market, as McGarkin says, celebrates and profits from difference just as it obliterates it. And this is where McGarkin says the theory really must start to start its explanatory work. Well, he's aware that this isn't quite as straightforward as it might look. Some intellectuals are contemptuous of foreign projections. Uh, uh, they think that these might trivialize their own domestic third world or developing country struggle, cultural and political struggle. And they may well be in a situation in which they're simultaneously alienated from and yet seek ownership over both myth and, as McGuckin says, its deconstruction. Both myth and its re-examination as to what went into it and what was left out. And he says, if the postmodern condition entails a hyperactive transnational circulation of things and meanings, such that cultural boundaries and identity and authenticity are increasingly impossible to define, then this by no means entails an end to the quest to construct and, as he says, solidify a self, a status, a commodity, and to stake those claims, to make those claims. Well, Bagakin has shown us how the production of, so to speak, ethnic or craft artifacts uh, isn't quite as simple as it looks. We do end up with, perhaps partly in response to an existing, to a new demand or a new market, we do end up with what are effectively commodity produced goods produced at piece rate payment rates for consumers, buyers, who seem to imbue these with their own meanings almost certainly in ignorance of the productive systems in which these goods were manufactured. Well, yes, McGuckin recognizes that designs may be quite innovative, targeted at the tastes of external consumers. Profits go to capitalists and vendors, the employers of the craftspeople. Artisans are therefore alienated from, well, from the artistic form of the goods. I won't say what McGuckin says. He quotes a, a, a laborer who says what the goods looked like. And they were extremely blunt. I can't possibly repeat those words here, or I could at risk. Um, and they're also alienated from returns on their labor. This is surplus value in a classic Marxian sense. But the low budget market also provides opportunities for small merchants who haven't a lot of capital to sell petty goods in competition with larger producers and vendors. Another, well, another of the complexities of, of merchant capitalism. So, what about the buyers? They're trying to find meaning in a deeper experience of one locale. So longer term travelers and volunteers, dharmas, that is presumably existential travelers and researchers, are more likely to buy relatively expensive commissioned goods, have things made for them on the stalls in the street, and perhaps those have to be manufactured more, have to be manufactured more closely in accordance with, in this case, Buddhist iconographical canons and principles. But for many consumers, artistic or technical authenticity is not as significant as the origin of the producers. Are they Tibetan and do they benefit from the exchange? Money from commission goods seems to flow more directly to the producer. Innovations may be introduced by the artisan or the consumer, rather than indirectly through the vendor who controls the work of the, of the actual person manufacturing the thing. 
But nevertheless, this brings its own tensions. It has created tensions in the Haramsala between, well, parents of Indian children who work as domestic workers, but who also, well, who don't deem, seem to work as, in, as child labor in the domestic industry, but ethnic tensions between those of Tibetan descent and those of Indian descent in the Haramsala, Indians in the Haramsala, seem to have intensified. But remember this, were children employed in the, the Haramsala cooperatives, trading, selling to tourists? It's quite likely that tourists and students and volunteers would certainly raise an outcry. And McGuckin says this. Well, McGuckin does raise further questions for us. He notes analyses of mass leisure and critiques of the kinds of things he's doing, critiques which suggest that we can't simply, we can't make sense of modernity simply by studying class, status and power and similar sociological antiquities, sightseeing according to McCannell and some of the other critics of this approach, um, becomes a kind of ritual played to the differentiations of society. Well, the point here, as McCannell, whom McGuckin seems to be disagreeing with, uh, McCannell says, very strikingly, what we face in craft markets such as those that McGuckin has described in Dharamshala or anywhere else, embody a form of staged authenticity. This is an authentic object which I produced 10 minutes ago or an authentic object that I've produced in accordance with traditional iconographic rules, but this has got nothing to do with, so to speak, my expressing a belief or a faith or some sort of participation in an iconic craft. I'm manufacturing this to sell it to you, but don't tell anyone, right? In effect, that's what I take staged authenticity to mean. Well, that is McGuckin's argument that we, we need a, a much closer analysis of what's happening in this kind of trade. He does seem to say that a form of modernism, Marxism, has been faulted for offering grand generalizations and is therefore un always under suspicion. Marxists have been accused of fetishizing production and neglecting the imagery and consumption which are central to industrial production. Marx is not quite as crude as that. He does note that production and distribution consumption form a perfect connection, precisely the kind of connection that McGuckin has been outlining. But could it be, and here McGuckin cites Umberto Eco talking about his travels in hyper-reality in the uh, western United States where he goes through the roadside attractions and the theme parks, the theme parks and so on. Echo, according to McGuckin, reads these as attempting to simulate a history that's already disappeared. Now, if that isn't postmodern, we might want to think what is. So that really is McGuckin's argument. And this would also apply to identity. Uh, Adams, whom McGuckin has already cited in a book called Tigers of the Snow and Other Virtual Sherpas, cautions us against thinking of Sherpa identity as anything sui generis, that is, of its own kind. Sherpas, according to Adams, have become virtual through the imitation of what the other takes to be their natural self. Now, that, in effect, McGuckin's arguing that that kind of reimagining and, in effect, re effective reconstruction of the identity of the goods also applies to those who produce the goods, the craft vendors and artisans in what we might very roughly, perhaps crudely, call third world markets for tourists from other parts of the world or even other parts of their own countries. Now, McGuckin ends quite correctly by saying, 
it becomes increasingly difficult to decide just what is our culture and their culture. We noted that in respect of multiculturalism, our uh, concluding topic in liberalism. The question ultimately is, what then is a culture? But it's not clear that we have to abandon, in order to understand what a culture is, it's not clear that we have to abandon all sense of production relations, of markets of production, productive activities, whether they're alienated and alienating or not. We can't abandon those, and that, I suggest, is McGuckin's great contribution. He's reminded us just how important production relations are, even in this world of apparently postmodern symbolism and production. And what he says is that an engaged anthropology can focus on how, how artisans are at once alienated from material and cultural capital, and how they might regain control over both. So, there we are. The practices, McGuckin quotes Brunner here, the practices and behavior of the tourist and the native are defined for them by the dominant story. Presumably the dominant story is the production relations that we identify as, so to speak, an essential element in our understanding of the relation between the, uh, the tourist, the craftsperson, and the imagined or real authenticity of the transaction, of the artifact, and of the producer and consumer. So that's the McGuckin paper. We'll go on to look at the second paper for us to consider, and that is the Aaron Hanlon the Aaron Hanlon paper on um, I'll just call it up if you give me a moment on the uh, impacts of postmodernism. It's a very forceful title. Paper's written in August 2018, just over a year ago. The title by Aaron Handlin that Aaron Handlin's given it is Postmodernism Didn't Cause Trump, It Explains Him. Well, what does what is Handlin's argument? He is uh, an assistant professor of English at a college in the United States, at Colby College. And he recognizes that postmodern theory is a problem. He starts by saying it may be the most loathed concept ever to have emerged from academia. Developed in literature and philosophy in the 1970s, in those departments doing those studies. It supposedly, according to Handlin, told us that facts are debatable, that individual perspectives matter most, shared meaning is an illusion, universal truth is a myth. We're familiar with these themes from our, from our earlier look at Derrida and Foucault. Now what were the political reactions? The cultural and I should add the political right. Hanlon just says the right. The right quickly identified these notions of fluidity, indeterminacy, and so on as a danger to the very foundation of society. And they spent decades, as Hanlon says, flogging the university lefties who promoted them. One particular author, Roger Kimball, accused academic theorists of trying to redefine the traditional humanities as what? I quote, a species of political grievance mongering. And in that form of grievance mongering, virtue equals whatever sexual, feminist, Marxist, racial or ethnic agenda to which the particular critic has declared his, but Kimball says his, allegiance. Another critic, Norman Pudhoritz, believed that postmodernism was an attack on moral order. We'll probably see why he said that. If any idea of universal morality is no more than a fictitious imposition or no more than a power operation upon all of us, then uh, the very idea of morality collapses and our pointing out the, so to speak, as postmodernists, if we pointed out the failings in ideas of monolithic or non-contradictory moral schemes and so on, we would presumably, according to Norman von Horitz, uh, be making an attack on moral order itself. Victor Davis Hanson even faulted postmodernism 
for the way President Barack Obama handled health care legislation. He said, I quote, In the gospel of postmodern relativism, what did it matter if the President of the United States promised that Obamacare would not alter existing health care plans when it was clear that it would? Well, later others joined, joined the, uh, the, 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 the crusade, if that's the right word, vilifying postmodernism. Centrists and liberals joined in. They searched for a culprit behind the ascent of Donald Trump, as Hanlon says. Michiko Kakutani, a noted author, wrote a book called The Death of Truth Blames Relativism and says it was caused by academics promoting the gospel of postmodernism. I quote that, academics promoting the gospel of postmodernism. Daniel Dennett, very famous logician, said in an interview in 2017, again I quote, I think the, what the postmodernists did was truly evil. Well, Vox, you know, sort of complimentary media outlet, claimed that it wasn't the first time Trump's legal team had played postmodernist. And of course, apparently Trump's legal team hinted that it might be too hard to discern the truth because it's all relative anyway. They may have been referring to Trump's, was it press secretary, was it Kellyanne Conway, who, who used the term alternative facts? Now we might say well, that's a thoroughly postmodern concept, alternative facts, right? And so the claim was made that Trump's legal team, perhaps Trump's entire White House team, were playing postmodernist. No, it's not true. We don't think it's true. We think it's something else, right? But the point here, Hanlon is quite right. These challenges to postmodern theory across the board identified something important. And what was it that we, what was the crisis that we faced? According to Hanlon, we were in the process of losing, perhaps had already lost, a shared vocabulary for the world's problems. That is, the ways we engage with, relate to one another, current events. And losing this shared vocabulary, he locates this in the United States, says may be the greatest threat to American society. What does it mean? He says, what did it mean that the pro-life movement, that is the anti-abortion movement, could fashion itself, that's his own term, as an avatar of women's empowerment? I quote, an avatar of women's empowerment. What did it mean that a white woman like Rachel Dolezal, if I hope to, I pronounced it right, could simply declare that she was black? So, the point is that, as Handen says, these were precisely the kinds of things that worried postmodern theorists. Perhaps we've got them wrong all along. Handen says their project was an attempt to understand why, why it was that people had begun to interpret material facts in such extraordinarily different ways. Well, Hannon reminds us that the term postmodern, at least in its modern sense or current sense, is inherited from, uh, from the work of Lyotard. And Lyotard observed that society was becoming a consumer society, a media society, a post-industrial society. These are not new themes. Adorno and Horkheimer, the great Marx scholars, were very nervous of the rise of consumer society. Herbert Marcuse, another member of the Frankfurt School, started to show the connections between consumer society and media society. A post-industrial society with the attacks on trade unions around the industrial world, or most of the industrial world in the, from the late 70s onwards. The uh, change in patterns of work to casualize large areas of the former industrial workforce, or put them out of work, simple as that have all been noted. Lyotard may not have been that far from, from the apparently thoroughly rational Marxist or other critics or other left-wing critics as uh, we might think they are. Frederick Jameson, in fact, points this out, that Lyotard saw these large-scale shifts as 
Salmon says, game changers, significant developments for art and science and the broader, broader question of how we know what we know. Well, Hanlon says, this was a diagnosis, not a political outcome that Lyotard and the others wanted to bring about or agitated to bring about. But subsequently, postmodernism has come to describe a range of theories about language and of, about knowledge in the world and so on. Hanlon says Jacques Derrida's concept of deconstruction sought to understand language as a system capable of constantly hiding and deferring meaning rather than a simple conduit for conveying it. Well, I've said in my critiques of postmodernism and poststructuralism earlier, I've said them in the previous lectures, said in the previous lectures, that uh, who's ever said that language is automatically transparent? Nobody's ever said that. When did we actually say it was a simple conduit for conveying meaning? That may be an implication in Saussure, but we're, we've also noted that much of Derrida's work is a sustained dialogue with Saussure. But Handlin goes on to talk about Baudrillard and the concept of the simulacrum, which we've already mentioned, we've already touched upon. And that is a copy without an original, which leads to a hyperreal, to the hyperreal, a collections of signs, a collection of signs or images, which purport to represent something that actually exists. Photographs of wartime combat. Ultimately, though, they portray a wild distortion not drawn from reality. Well, yes, Hanlon is trying to argue that the postmodernists had identified something significant about our time and that they were, in a sense, diagnosing our condition. They were changing our understanding of language, truth, and knowledge. Well, Marx did say, we noted this, philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. But it's been said that philosophers of postmodernity have invented the point, right? And have sought mainly to interpret the world rather than change it. That's one of the accusations against them. It's been made very widely. Alan Bloom noted Literary theorist and culture, culture critic in the United States, noted for a conservative attitude, wrote a book in the 1980s, I think published in 1987, called The Closing of the American Mind. It's a very fine work. If it's any help, it was acclaimed, if I'm not mistaken, I read it when it came out, if, if I'm not mistaken, it was treated, treated very seriously and taken very, had a very high reputation among um, people right across the political spectrum in the humanities. But Alan Bloom challenged postmodern theorists not necessarily for their diagnosis of the postmodern condition, but for accepting that the postmodern condition, as they saw it, is inevitable. Bloom understood that postmodernism didn't simply emerge from what Hanlon calls the pet theories of wayward, wayward English professors. Instead, Bloom saw it as a cultural moment brought on by forces greater than the university. It didn't just, postmodernism didn't just happen because a few professors wrote a few things about it, a few papers about it. There were wider forces at work, and it could well be that postmodernism represented some of those and attempted to diagnose some of those. But of course, within, within academia, within the university, within the academy, Bloom was particularly worried about students uh, who pursued commercial interests about truth or wisdom. He was troubled by what he called, you know, he saw as the insidious influence of pop music, he lamented parental loss of self-control over children's moral education, and so on. He called the rock music industry perfect capitalism, supplying to demand and helping create it. These are all quotations from Alan Bloom, which, um, which uh, Hanlon gives us. And rock music in, the rock music industry, according to, to Bloom, was perfect capitalism with all the moral dignity of drug trafficking. They're powerful phrases written by a very accomplished scholar who could also write very clearly and very forcefully. But since then, those who, like Bloom, have been on the cultural and perhaps political right, have, according to, to Handlon, contorted, crassly contorted, Bloom's forceful arguments. Bloom can at least be disagreed with. Right? Uh, and according to Handlon, Bloom's followers on the right, or Bloom's successors on the right, have crassly contorted Bloom's arguments 
and instead have said that postmodernism was made not by consumerism and other large scale technological developments around the world, instead it was created by dangerous lefty academics. Uh, Kimball called them tenured radicals, that is the title of his book, uh, a book against the academic left. And this treats postmodernism, this approach treats postmodernism as a form of left wing politics, with its own set of tenets and principles of course, rather than a broader cultural moment that left wing academics diagnosed and identified. Well, Handon concludes that today critics on both left and right are happy to wave their fingers at postmodern theory, so long as they can blame it for the Trump electorate's apparently unprecedented disregard for the truth. Uh, in one journal, uh, an online magazine, which is apparently obsessed with the, according to Handel, obsessed with the evils of critical theory and postmodernism, somebody called Matt McManus reflects on the emergence and rise of postmodern conservatism. I don't know what sense that makes. Um, and a right wing scholar, David Ernst, contends that, I quote, Trump is the first president to turn postmodernism against itself. From the left, there's another critique, relativism. This is Kakutani again, Michiko Kakutani, writing in The Guardian. Relativism has been ascendant since the culture wars began in the 1960s. Back then, it was embraced by the new left. This is a quotation from Kakutani. Since back then, back in the 1960s, Relativism was embraced by the new left, who were eager to expose the biases of Western bourgeois male dominated thinking, and by academics pro promoting the gospel of postmodernism, which argued against that there are no universal truths, only smaller personal truths. And these were, therefore, perceptions shaped by the cultural and for social forces of one day. Since then, of course, according to Kalkutani, relativistic arguments have been hijacked by the populist right. Well, these arguments have been put elsewhere, as Handler notes, or similar arguments have been put elsewhere. And interestingly, they, some of them contend that even if right-wing politicians and other deniers of science were not reading Derrida and Foucault, uh, according to Lee McIntyre for one, the germ of the idea, that is postmodernism, made its way to them. The writers, therefore, as Handlon says, invoke postmodernism to describe not a contested set of observations about the state of knowledge and culture, but instead they seem to regard postmodernism as a committed belief system that forms the basis of partisan politics. Um, Michiko Kakutani's words, the gospel of postmodernism, suggests that there is just such a system, some kind of political gospel that's reached the far right, or that the far right have grasped and exploited. But this is misleading in two ways. One, it treats Lyotard and his fellows, his followers, as proponents, as expounding a world where objective truth loses all value. It doesn't treat them as analysts who wanted to explain why this had already happened. Secondly, as soon as postmodernism became a fashionable topic in humanities and social sciences, it became a subject of, of extensive debate. It is highly contested and hotly contested. And there we are. I mean, I've participated in my own small way in that contest. I'm certainly not the only one. There are hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions around the world who continue to recognize significant challenges in postmodernism and post-structuralism, but to take issue with them where we would argue we need to take issue with them. That's exactly what I've tried to do here. So Handler moves on. If we are going to claim that Trump, Trumpism and alt-right relativism or the triumph of the populist far right are consequences of the academic left's supposition about what was happening, then we must show it, we must demonstrate the connection. But the difficulty is that, as Hanlon says, commentators trying to trace these connections really are far too casual about causality. They could easily be postmodernists themselves, as Hanlon himself says. <laughs>
Well, yes, it is true that the populist right uses relativistic arguments. Identity politics is bad when people of color, people who aren't white, I'm using the American phrase there, people of color, which Hanlon uses. Identity politics is bad when people who aren't white use it or em embrace it, but identitarianism, that is, white nationalist identity politics, is good and necessary for white survival. Well, yes, isn't that a postmodernist kind of argument, right? But that doesn't mean it happens because of postmodernism. And McIntyre goes further and notes that figures like intelligent design theorists, Philip Johnson, for example, conspiracy theorists like Mike Cernovich or Chernovich, cite the influence of postmodern theory on their projects. But once again, even they, even Lee McIntyre, recognizes, acknowledges, doc acknowledges documents, right-wing think tanks and corporate-backed firms, corporate fronts, like tobacco industry, I quote, I'm quoting here, research in inverted commas. These had establi already established alternative facts programs for the right, long before creative misinformation entrepreneurs came round. Now, we mustn't forget that, that major corporate bodies which face scandals, say, over the addictive and deadly nature of tobacco, of perhaps alcohol as well, certainly fossil fuel corporations, are into the PR industry in a very big way, and they've got billions to pour into it. If they don't actually deny the harm, they certainly seek to represent it in ways that could and probably do seriously mislead us as to the harm. Well, Hanlon goes on. Certainly postmodern theory is difficult. Partly because of the ways philosophical jargon is translated. Yes, many of the great postmodernists have written in French, and um, there would be significant issues of translation. Um, but it's also because much of the writing is, as we've, as I've already said in the lectures, abstruse, difficult, and occasionally unclarifiable. That is Hanlon's own phrase. Um, an undergraduate, which Chernovich was when he wrote his critique, or a layperson would almost inevitably come up with, come away with misreadings. Well, we're all going to struggle with difficult texts. Kant's Critique of Pure Reason it may be one of the great works, greatest works ever written, but who ever said that there was a single way to read it, or that it meant a single thing? We'd have to argue for our readings. And it is here that Handlin says, well, Current trends long predate postmodern theory. Kakutani herself opens her essay in The Guardian by quoting Hannah Arendt, 1951, The Origins of Totalitarianism. I quote, The ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction three dots there, showing it's an extended quotation, and the distinction between true and false. I paraphrase that. According to Arendt in The Origins of Totalitarianism, which is recommended in this course as well, the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the con convinced communist. It's someone for whom, people for whom, the distinction between fact and fiction and between true and false have both collapsed. Arendt herself thought political dissimulation, political lying, deception, and so on, manipulation, were much older. Of course they were much older. She knew that, so does everyone else. The deliberate falsehood, Arendt herself says in 1971 in an essay called Lying in Politics, the deliberate falsehood and the outright lie, used as a legitimate means to achieve political ends, have been with us since the beginning of recorded history. But, as Hanlon says, we can't say that academic meditations on postmodernity have had no influence on culture at all, but it's just the actual evidence is scarce. Well, he does recognize that, you know, he says Frederick Jameson's reflections on conspiracy theory are not what convinced people that 
climate change is a hoax or the Democrat Party has been running off a pedophile ring out of a Washington pizza parlor. It's, if you like, Facebook propaganda or Twitter propaganda that's doing that. It's highly organized propaganda by people who buy climate change deniers. As we've seen, that is hugely funded. And of course, we don't have to look very far to find all manner of conspiracy theories on the net. Similarly, the Trump investigation claim, made by Trump himself, that the Trump-Russia investigation is a made-up story, an ex a Democrat excuse for losing an election. Well, that's not a postmodernist critique of the evidence the Mueller investigation has gathered. That's not postmodernist. It's political chicanery. And Handlin says so. The problem, then, is that if we are so eager to blame postmodernism for Trump-era politics, we fail to see the explanatory value of postmodernism. For example, Baudrillard's book, The Gulf War Did Not Take Place, becomes the denial of an objective truth so obvious as the Gulf War happened. But Baudrillard is trying to tell us something about the way we've symbolized and represented the Gulf War. right? So it's not just the denial of an objective truth. The point is that our impressions have been warped, this is Handlon's own term, by media framing and agitprop, to use a very old-fashioned political term. The real enemy of truth, as Handlon says, is not postmodernism, but propaganda, the active distortion of truth for political purposes. Trumpism practices this form of distortion, as he says, on a daily basis. We're familiar with that in all political life today. We're not at all surprised by it. The point for us is to be alert to it. And Hannah concludes, the postmodernist theorists whom we vilify didn't cause it, but they have given us a way of understanding how, precisely how, as Hanlon says, falsehood can masquerade as truth. So that's a very thoughtful, very incisive analysis of how to understand postmodernism, not as the origin of a vicious, evil, mendacious politics, but as a way of understanding how we've got where we are, if that is where we are. It's philosophy in a much older tradition. It's a very incisive analysis by Handlon. Well, we've got something to move on to, which is, um, which is this, the, the, the impact of, uh, well, our third item in this seminar discussion is, or seminar type discussion, is uh, an analysis, a, a paper by, a review by Michael Beroubet of a book by Alan Sokal on the hoax that he played on the journal Social Text in 1996. The book is called Beyond the Hoax. The subtitle is Science, Philosophy and Culture by Alan Sokal, published in 2008 by Oxford University Press. And Beirubey gives us the background. In 1966, as you know, Alan Sokal played this elaborate trick, in particular on the uh, editors of a broadly leftist journal called Social Text. He submitted an essay filled with six kinds of nonsense, or at least six. The editors either didn't see that or were willing to countenance the nonsense and published the essay. In response, a great many scholars in the humanities and social sciences lashed out, as uh, Berube says, in ways that often made them look even worse than the editors. And on the other side of the argument, SoCal found himself hailed, that's the actual word here, by legions of fans and supporters who credited him with finally exposing the vacuity of cultural studies, literary theory, postmodernism, obscurantist jargon, science studies, people who write about disciplines that they don't know much about, and all the above. Well, after that, since then, as Beirube says, he's met a number of colleagues who spit and curse at the very sound of SoCal's name, and a much larger number of people who credit SoCal with uh, proving, apparently once and for all, 
that everything humanists have done since 1970 has been bunk. Well, since then, Sokal, Sokal is a perfectly serious physicist. Um, he's teamed up with Jean Bricmont and severely criticized epistemological relativism. That is the idea that knowledge is relative in the philosophy of science, a perfectly serious area of philosophy itself. So Callan Breakmore note that major figures in science studies, or philosophy of science if you like, sometimes say things like the validity of theoretical propositions in the sciences is in no way affected by factual evidence. That's one. Secondly, there is no sense, another quotation, there is no sense attached to the idea that some standards or beliefs are rational, really rational as distinct from merely being locally accepted as such. Well, does this indicate the existence of a, as Sokal himself says, a radically relativist academic zeitgeist, zeitgeist being the spirit of the times, a German word. Well, Birube is careful. Yes, it is weird to think, it, is weird, it would be weird if we were living in a radically relativistic zeitgeist, but we must remember that standards of weirdness tend to vary from discipline to discipline. That's hardly surprising. SoCal seems never to have been comfortable dealing with people who, so to speak, hypothesize imaginary gardens with real toads in them, or meditate on, as Berube says, cold pastorals that tease us out of thought. But Sokal is no longer engaged in literary theory, and he's gone into the philosophy of science, as Berube says, into realms where the distinction between justified and unjustified belief actually matters to the world, specifically the history and philosophy of science. And this seems apparently to be conducted sometimes by people who, are, as Berube says, rigorously indifferent to the question of whether a scientific theory is actually true. Um, and Sokal has gone also into the philosophy of religion. Uh, well, it's a bit of a generalization to say that religion is practiced by people who are rigorously indifferent to the claim that beliefs should be rationally justified. That's a, that's a little bit hasty. I'd say it's, it's a bit hasty. But Sokal apparently spends his first hundred pages or so in Beyond the Hoax, talking about the hoax itself, and providing a context like a recap. He, um, he does say he's proud of his social, social text article, and the reviewer, Beirube, is quite critical, saying he repeats himself too much in this collection of essays. Sokal himself says that his defense of scientific realism, the idea that science speaks the truth and the bald truth or whatever, um, is modest. Sokal says his defense of scientific realism is modest. And according to Beirube, this is a virtue. It makes the Sokal defense of scientific realism cogent and convincing. That's the actual phrase Beirube uses. Sokal recognizes that science is a human endeavor. Like any other human endeavor, it merits being subjected to rigorous social analysis. Not so problematic. He has good things to say about Thomas Kuhn's book, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which Sokal apparently calls moderate arguments. But the distinction, according to Sokal, is the difference between the context of discovery and the context of justification. Sokal recognizes that any number of factors, you know, scientific and non-scientific, can contribute to the discovery of natural laws. Nothing surprising about that, nothing unusual. People have discovered a lot of natural laws by accident. Was it penicillin was discovered when was it Fleming returned to his lab, having forgotten a, a Petri dish and found that a particular fungus had, uh, had an effect on the culture in, in the Petri dish? And we have good reason to be grateful for the fact that he noticed it and didn't simply wash the Petri dish out, if it was a Petri dish, that is. Context of discovery, certainly. Very few scientists would actually deny that. Uh, it can range from the details of lab life to 
the ways research funding is done, which is often, well, the term used here is vicissitudes. Yes, some people get funded, some don't. There's not always an obvious reason for it, and so on. Newton himself, as we've noted, I think, earlier, spent a lot of his time in the study of alchemy and the divine. Einstein was reluctant to believe in an expanding universe. But those are the contexts of discovery. The context of justification is quite a different thing. And according to Berube, apparently according to Sokal as well, the existence of X-rays or the precession of Mercury's perihelion cannot and does not depend on factors extraneous to outside the scientific evidence which help us to reach a conclusion. In other words, yeah, it's, it makes good sense to be a historical relativist in respect of the context of discovery. Newton himself believed in God. And even Socal, who regards this as delusional, acknowledges that, you know, he knows perfectly well that people of different times and different places have different means of coming to conclusions about how the universe works. And we might even have different beliefs about that, different ways of thinking about it and reaching conclusions in one particular period, let alone many. But according to Socal, properly scientific belief, and this seems to be according to Berube as well, is distinguished by its insistence, almost a meta-belief, as Berube says, that justified true beliefs can be validated only by rigorous rational inquiry. So, Berube continues with his review of SoCal, a review of SoCal, and SoCal apparently pauses repeatedly to ask why so many people in the postmodern, in inverted commas, postmodern humanities and social sciences have been so hostile to the idea that the context of justification might in fact involve epistemological realism of some kind. Sokal sees it as a sociological question, and Berube continues on those lines. But, he reminds us of the ways in which our readings of even the terms, terms like science, particularly Western science, may conjure up certain images in our minds. He says when, Berube says, when some people think of Hiroshima, hear the term Western science, they think of Hiroshima and Agent Orange and the Union Carbide plant in Popal, and not, say, of the discovery of neutrino oscillation. So, we, apparently we move from, some of us then move from skepticism about the benefits of Western science to the conclusion that the Enlightenment was no more than a stalking horse for imperialism. Foucault seems to move to the conclusion that the search for knowledge is just a search for power, and I, as you've seen, I've severely criticized that with reasons. Well, why should postmodern intellectuals champion local knowledges and the heterogeneity of language games? Well, there may be arguments about what Wittgenstein meant by a language game, but we'll take the phrase at face value for now, the heterogeneity of language games. Why should we champion those against the universalist aspirations of the Enlightenment? Well, Berube says that, well, academic leftists in the humanities who do that are themselves, you know, thinking of warm and fuzzy feelings, as he himself says, that, I quote, we lefties have about the local from our local independent bookstore. Yes, I'm on the committee of one, the local independent, a cooperative bookstore in my hometown of Southampton to our local independent food co-op. Yes, um, I used to shop at one of those, and there are plenty of them around today as well, all over the world. Yes, there are good things about the local, but the risk of not being sufficiently alert or critical about them means that we forget that many of our local knowledges are parochial, reactionary, and or theocratic. Uh, or worse, I add. And Berube rightly points out that defending a variety or heterogeneity, as he calls it, of language games, 
has proceeded as if it's the moral equivalent of a defense of species diversity. It's not. It leads us into moral relativism. It could make us unable to decide whether genocide or a, is a good or a bad thing. Are the language games of charlatans or fascists to be preserved against the language games of the indigenous people of the Americas? That is Berube's example. And um, Berube draws upon an example here, the biologist Mira Nanda. In 2004, she wrote a book called Prophets Facing Backwards, or oh, Prophets Facing Backward, I beg your pardon. And this showed that opportunistic far-right Hindu nationalists have, I quote again, appealed precisely to postmodern and postcolonial critiques of, critiques of Enlightenment universalism in order to promote, apparently, Vedic science and what Beru Bey calls a reactionary political agenda. Sokal follows Nanda's argument, apparently to good effect. But Sokal himself seems to go on to think that arguing against relativism in the sciences requires a parallel argument against postmodern pragmatism in human affairs. And, um, well, at that point, it could well be that SoCal is, how should I put it, writing in areas that he's not that familiar with. Um, for example, Pragmatism can be opposed to realism, but realism itself is not exactly an innocent term. And in international affairs, in other theories in the social sciences, in international relations and other theories in the social sciences, realism carries a connotation of deep conservatism and an unquestioning acceptance of the existing order and its power relations. So, well, the point is that SoCal may not be fully alert to to the kinds of implications of methods he's espousing. But Sokal himself, as Berube notes, contends that fundamentalism and not abstruse li literary theory is the most important current challenge science and reason face. Now that is a much stronger claim and one that could certainly be argued for. In fact, we shall soon move on to theocracy and fundamentalism as our next topic. Well, where does Berube end up? He says, yes, um, SoCal has undertaken a necessary task, that of struggling against religious fundamentalism, but he then may want to reconsider the value of pragmatism in human affairs. That is, of learning to compromise, get on with each other, rub shoulders, keeping disagreements at arm's length, or learning how to talk about them. In other words, engage in civilized political life, which may inherit strong elements of liberalism. It could inherit strong elements of conservatism. It could also, as we shall see, inherit strong elements in republicanism, which we come to later on in this course. But according to Berube, then we can move decisively beyond the hoax. SoCal has certainly recognized that the kinds of issues he raised in his original hoax open up and lead, him, lead himself into much more significant issues in the philosophy of science and the philosophy of the social sciences and into what is actually involved in postmodern theorizing about literature. So that concludes our analysis of post-structuralism and post-modernism, and we shall move on to another topic next time.